Well, sometimes I stand up here and I'll give a certain message and it's instructional. Mm -hmm. Kind of talking about what's going on in current events and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Sometimes I'll talk about things that are, you know, like looming judgment or sometimes I'll talk about things that are maybe a little uncomfortable and some people entitle them beat the sheep messages. I try not to do that very often. But whatever God tells me to say, I have to say. But today, I'm glad to say that I feel like this message is like God's way of just giving us all a big hug. Because, you know, I realize that life is tough. I live in the same world you do, and I see the same things going on that you do, and life is tough. And sometimes we just need to be encouraged and know that we're not going through this battle alone. Now, I want to start by just describing briefly our situation, us human beings. Now, you know who you are, and I know who I am, and we get a good glimpse of the people that we live with in this world, and things that are going on. And there was a man by the name of Isaiah, a prophet, and he was taken into the throne room. And when he got there and he saw the Lord, he realized, uh-oh, I'm out of my league. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, Isaiah said this, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you see Jesus, I pray that for people all the time. Lord, let them see you. Maybe not visually, but just in their spirit, in their heart, conceptualize who Jesus really is. Once we get a good glimpse, glimpse of who Jesus really is, we, we cower in His comparison. And it puts things in the proper perspective. And here this man Isaiah is saying, I'm undone. I don't even deserve to be here. And he says, not, not only that, I live in a world of people that don't deserve to be here. Can we relate to that or not? We all have issues. We all have problems. We live around family members, neighbors, people we work with, people we live in the same state and country with, people we live the same planet with. We're all undone. Then... There was a man named Peter who the first time he met Jesus, Jesus said, go back out in the boat. I'm going to teach you how to fish. And Peter was mad. Don't tell me how to fish. I've been fishing this lake my whole life. Anyhow, to make a long story short, he throws the net in on the other side like Jesus told him to and catches more fish than he ever caught in his whole life. And when he pulls all the fish in, then in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, it says, When Simon Peter saw it, meaning all the fish that he pulled in, he realized this is supernatural. I've been fishing my whole life. I've never seen so many fish in one net. It says, He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And again, here's a man like you and I, in the presence of Jesus, realizing all that He is, and He says, in comparison, I'm a wreck. Now, in Romans 3.10, it says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Two weeks ago, last time I preached here, I finished my sermon by saying, you know what? All we are is we're all just beggars. No human being is better than anyone else. Yeah, some people may have more money, or have more stuff, or be more handsome, or more wealthy, or you know, more fame and renown, but we're all in the same boat. We're all just beggars. Trouble is that most people don't realize that. Even some Christians say, well, don't you know who I am? I'm holy. Well, I say baloney. You're a sinful man, just like Peter, just like Isaiah. Now, we're righteous because of what Jesus has made us, but in ourselves, we're no better than anyone else. All we are as followers of Jesus is just people that found food. 
Just imagine if you're in the in the depression, or you're in a famine, and you're talking to people and they're shriveling up, they're just wasting away to nothing, and you're just eating, you got this big warehouse full of food, you say, hey, come on, I found a place where we can eat, and it never runs out. We can come and we can drink, and you're never thirsty again. And that is Jesus. The woman that um, Elijah ran into at the famine, she said, well, I got enough oil to make one cake. Me and my son are going to eat it. Then we're going to die. But because she gave to that prophet, her oil never ran out for the entire famine. And she fed all the neighbors. The woman at the well offered Jesus water. He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for some of this here uh, living water. You'd never thirst again. So we're all just beggars. Except we found food. We found hope. We found life. So the condition of man is not so hot on our own. But then there's God. And that's where the story changes completely. Now, Moses is he's run away from Egypt and he's in the in the desert. He's he's um being a, sh a shepherd, just taking care of someone else's flock. And one day he looks up at Mount Sinai and he's always wondering about this God that they talk about. And he sees something and he says, there's a bush up there and it's on fire, but it doesn't seem to be consumed. And he goes up there and you know the story, he takes his sandals off because he's on holy ground. But then in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, when God told Moses, go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, Moses says this unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and they shall say unto me, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, Well, what is his name? And what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. He said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. That's God's name, I am that I am, which means I'm it and there is no one other. Now in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3, then God says to Moses, And I appeared unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So God is now going to reveal himself to the children of Israel, not just as I am, but as Jehovah. And when you put the two together, he's saying, I am Jehovah. I am. So what I want to mention to you today, I want to bring up the names of Jehovah and what they mean. And when you think about this, Everything that we're not, because we're a needy people. We're all just beggars looking for food, looking for water. And we come to this almighty God that is I am that I am. He's the ultimate. When we come to him, this is how he refers to himself to us. First of all, he's known as Jehovah Yahweh. So I am Jehovah Yahweh. Now that word Yahweh is the original name of God in the Hebrew text. And it comes from the letters Y-H-W-H. No, no vowels, just all consonants. And this is a four-letter Hebrew word that's called the Tetragrammaton. And what it means is the name that cannot be uttered. How do you utter Y-H-W-H? How do you say that? How do you pronounce that? It can't be pronounced because God's name is so magnificent. His name is so awesome, it can't be pronounced by human beings. So he comes to us in forms of his name to show us the character of who he is. So the first way he comes to us is, I am Jehovah Yahweh. I am, I am so high above anything and anyone else you've ever known. His name is Jehovah Elohim. And the word Elohim means the all-powerful God alone. Remember how he said in, in the first commandment, 
you know, thou shalt have no gods above me. Because he's the ultimate supreme God. This magnificent God that we can refer to as Father, and not only Father, but Abba, is when Elijah, or I'm sorry, when Isaiah saw him, he says, I'm undone. I don't even deserve to be here. When Peter realized who he, Jesus was and he was in his presence, he said, I'm sinful. Depart from me. Get away from me. But what God, us human beings are saying, God, stay away. But what God is saying is, no, I want to come closer. And he's showing himself through these titles of Jehovah. I am Jehovah. And as we go through these, notice, whatever we're lacking, that's what he is. The next name is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Now, let me ask you a question. Does anybody here have everything you need and everything you've ever wanted? Can I come live at your house? Because I could give you a list of the things I need and the things I'd like. But you know what? In God's kingdom, He's lacking nothing. So He comes to us and He says, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. You know, there's so many times... You know, I don't know about in your house, but at my house, I'm filling out bills at the end of the month, and I'm just hoping there's enough money left over that nothing's going to bounce. And, you know, I just, yeah, okay, we made it another month, we made it through. And you just say, Lord, I don't know how it's going to happen again next month, but you know what? He provides. He's always there. He said that He will meet our needs according to His riches and glory, but He will provide, not just financially. But He'll provide whatever we need. You need spiritual nourishment? You reach out to Him. You draw nigh unto Him, He'll draw nigh unto you. You take one step towards Him, He'll take ten steps towards you. Whatever you need. I'm lonely. I need a friend. He says, well, show yourself to be friendly. He says, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's me. I'll never leave you. You're never lonely. But yes, we all need what we call Jesus with skin on. We all need a friend. He will provide that. He will provide people in your lives if you're willing to reach out of your comfort zone. Whatever you need. I need emotional healing. He will provide whatever we need. He's our provider. He says, I am your Jehovah Jireh. Don't worry about anything. You know, we are fearful beings. It's just our nature. And remember what Jesus said? He says, consider the birds of the air. They don't, they don't go to work. They don't have a 401k. They don't put in, invest in Wall Street. They don't have any stocks. But you know what? The Lord feeds them every day. And he says, you mean to tell me that God's going to take care of these little sparrows, but he's not going to take care of you? Because Jesus didn't come to earth to die for the sparrows. He came to earth to die for you. So if He takes care of these little birds, you mean He's not going to take care of you? But have you ever watched a bird? You know, we always say, oh, free as a bird. But have you ever watched a bird? Yeah, they're free when they're flying through the air, but when they come down and land on the, on the ground, they're pretty nervous little guys. They're looking, oh, is someone going to come eat me? Is there a cat around here? Is there a dog in it? And they're just always looking, but then they peck on the ground, and then they get their head up and they look around, and they just peck and they hop along a little bit more and they peck in the ground and finally they get a worm. They always get a worm. A worm a day will keep the hunger pains away. <laughs> but they got to work. Have you ever woke up in the morning and seen a bunch of birds in your backyard going, <laughs> waiting for it to rain worms? Doesn't happen, does it? They got to work for it. But if they work for it, God always provides. The Bible says the man that doesn't work shouldn't eat. God wants us to work. You know that almost every single person that God called in the Bible was working when He called them? God likes us to work. He made us to work. And I don't want to ruin your image of heaven, but you know what? We're going to have jobs to do in heaven throughout all eternity. We're not going to sit on a cloud and eat marshmallows and play harps. I mean, I'd be bored with that in about 10 minutes. He's going to have things for us to do. 
But if we do our part, I guarantee you he'll do his part. He's Je he says, I am your Jehovah Jireh. We have needs. We're needy people. But if we're willing to do our part, he will provide. Now, he may not give us everything we want, but he will give us everything we need. But every once in a while, just like you that are good parents, you know, you tell your kids, make your bed and I'll give you a nickel. I don't know what the going rate is for allowances nowadays. Probably a whole lot more than a nickel. No kid would want to live at my house, that's for sure. But you, you make your bed and I'll give you a dollar or whatever. But every once in a while you say, you know what, I just love you. I want to bless you. Here's a new bike. Or here's a new baseball glove. Or whatever you want. You just want to bless your kids. That's our Father. He gives us the desires of our heart. But He will meet our needs. So the first thing we got to know about this Jehovah Yahweh, this Jehovah Elohim, who's the almighty, magnificent, powerful God above all gods, because there are really no other gods. They're all small Gs. They're just devils putting on false personas, fake news. The true and the living God says, I'm your provider. So what are you worried about? He then says, I am Jehovah Rapha. That means the Lord that heals. Okay, I got some issues with this one. You know how bad it hurts when I go like this? Don't tell me God's going to heal me. When I, the only time in my life when I ever heard Jesus audibly speak to me, it was because I was so upset that He didn't heal me from some things I was asking Him to heal me about, and I thought I didn't have enough faith, and He was mad at me. The only time I ever audibly heard Him speak, and I'll never forget it, I can take you right to the spot and show you where He was standing and where I was sitting in this church. And He says, I don't want to perfect your body, I want to perfect your soul. We're going to get a glorified body in the twinkling of an eye. That's no big deal for him. What he's working on is our soul. But yeah, when Jesus was here on earth, he healed the multitudes. How come he's not healing us? Whenever anyone asks Jesus to heal them, I guarantee you they're healed. Well, I've prayed many times and it still hurts when I go like this. Well, all I can tell you is he's doing something. Now, sometimes he heals in the miraculous. That's what we all like. We all want to see that instant miraculous healing. You know, I just let's all line up and get miraculously healed. That's what we want. But think about it. All those people that Jesus healed of the multitudes that came forward, they were probably miraculously healed. Maybe some were, some weren't. But a good portion of them were. But guess what? Go talk to one of them. Ask them what it was like. Oh, that's wait. You can't. They're all dead. They all died. And you know what the sad thing is? Some of those people that Jesus miraculously physically healed may not have been His disciples and they may not be with Him in His kingdom right now. So if Jesus just comes and physically heals everybody every time we pray, you know what? Human nature being the way it is, we would take it for granted. He's working on our soul. That word heal is the Greek, the Greek word sozo, and it means to make whole physically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what he wants to do. He wants to heal us completely. The physical part, yeah, it hurts. But you know what? Jesus said, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And remember when the Apostle Paul three times prayed, Lord, get rid of this thorn in my flesh. And the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient unto you. Now God gives each one of us enough grace for today. Now if I start worrying about tomorrow, I don't have tomorrow's grace. So when I think about tomorrow, I'm going to be all tied up in a knot. And I'm going to be all worried. and Oh no, how am I going to make it? And if it hurts to go like this today, it's going to hurt twice as much when I go like this tomorrow. You know what? God will give you tomorrow's grace tomorrow. That's why He says, take no thought for the morrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I'm giving you enough grace to handle today. And I'm telling you, no matter what you're going through, my grace is sufficient. 
Now when you face tomorrow, then I'll have tomorrow's grace to handle. Because you don't know you might be miraculously healed tomorrow, or you don't know what's going to happen. It's just like the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. They got up every morning and they had to go out and they had to gather manna. And they could gather as much as they want, but they had to eat it that day. Because if they said, you know what, I don't want to gather manna tomorrow. I'm going to gather twice as much today. And then I want to just sit back and take it easy tomorrow. You know what would happen? That manna would rot. And it would smell. So they wouldn't even want to eat it. Because God says, go out every day and look for that manna. Look for that grace. Except on Fridays was the only day they could gather twice as much. Because on Saturday, the Sabbath, He didn't want them collecting manna. It's the same thing with His grace. He doesn't want us, okay, Lord, I want you to explain how you're going to take care of me for the rest of my life. Step by step, I want to know everything. Well, the just live by faith. There's no faith in that. He says, just trust me. I'll give you enough grace to handle today. When tomorrow comes, I'll give you enough grace to handle that. And when it comes to healing, I wish that I could pray for you and all your aches and pains would go away. Someday they will. And someday they might in this world too. But sometimes He heals miraculously. Sometimes He heals over a slow period of time. Sometimes we have to change our actions. And sometimes we just don't know. But I guarantee you, I'll make a date with you. A hundred years from now, tell me how you're feeling. And I guarantee you we're all going to be dancing and joyful and nothing's going to hurt. Guarantee. So he then says, I am Jehovah Makedesh, which means I am the Lord who sanctifies you and makes you holy. You are me? Don't you know who I am? He makes me holy. He sanctifies me. Now, before I go back into that, I've got to jump up ahead a little bit to I am Jehovah Sidkenu, which means I am the Lord, your righteousness. And that little snippet we saw about what the ladies are going to be studying in Bible study, I am the righteousness of Christ. I am righteous, but only because of what Jesus did. Like I always called it the great exchange. I gave Jesus my sin. He gave me his righteousness. On my own, I'm in a heap of trouble. I'm like Isaiah and Peter saying, I'm undone. Depart from me, Lord. But in Jesus, I'm the righteousness of Jesus. When God the Father looks at me, all he sees is Jesus. And you know Jesus is righteous. So he is our Jehovah Sidkenu. He's the one that makes us righteous. And because of that, he's our Jehovah Makadesh, which means I am the one that sanctifies you. You know what that means to be sanctified? He takes you out and He has a special purpose for you. You know, nobody in this world is here by accident. You know, you've heard me say many times before, my stepdad used to tell me all the time, you were an accident, you should have never been born, you don't deserve to breathe air. And I don't say that to make you feel sorry for me, because I don't want you to feel sorry for me, I'm fine. And me and my stepdad are great with one another, and he's in heaven right now waiting for me. But that's how I was trained to think I was an accident. You may have thought that, or you may have been given that message somewhere along the line. Well, the way we're treated in this world is nothing but a number. All you are is an address, a bank account number, a social security number, an employee number. That's all you are is a number, one out of seven billion, but not to God. There's no accidents. He's got a plan for you. And he knew exactly when he was going to put you on the planet Earth, what time in history, who your mom and daddy was going to be, who your brothers and sisters were going to be. He knew everything about you, and he's got a plan. He sanctified you. And the first thing you got to do is give your life to Jesus so he can make you the righteousness of Christ. Then you got to stick with him so he can conform you into the image of Christ and make you into that person, that man and woman He wants you to be, so He can then use you to fulfill that plan. And believe me, it's good. Because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. He's got nothing but good things for us. I didn't say easy. 
I said, good. So Jehovah, he's our Jehovah, my Kadesh. He's the one that sanctifies you, and he's the one that makes you holy. Me? Yeah, you. In God's eyes, you're holy. You're set apart for a special purpose. He then goes on to say, I am Jehovah Shalom, which means I am the Lord of your peace. Now, we live in a pretty crazy world, a lot of turmoil. It's hard to have peace in this world. But think of what Jesus said. Jesus said to me, and he said to you, he said, my peace I give you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And when he says, I give you peace, he then explains what kind of peace. My peace. Let me ask you a question. Just picture in your mind Jesus, wherever he is right now. Well, we know he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But just picture what he must look like, where he is. Do you think he's worried about anything? Well, the same peace he has, he wants to give to you. He says, peace I give you. My peace I give unto you. And not as the world giveth. Because when the world gives you peace, there's always some kind of uh, little strings attached. you got to jump through this hoop. The devil says, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Yeah, look at those that follow him. They end up being drug addicts, alcoholics. They're married 12 times. Their kids hate them and then they die of a miserable mess. No, thank you. The way Jesus gives us peace, not as the world giveth. No strings attached. Freedom. Complete peace. And you may say, yeah, but all right, I believe in Jesus and I want peace, but I just... I don't have any peace in my life. Remember when Jesus went to Mary and Martha's house? Martha's in the kitchen rattling the pots and pans, working her head off because Jesus is there. And I got to do this for Jesus, that for Jesus, this for Jesus. And she was a mess. Mary's just sitting at his feet. And Martha comes out and says, Hey, baby sister, would you get your rear end in here and help me cook dinner for Jesus? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Martha. You're troubled about so many things. Don't you know Mary's chosen the better part? We always, we have in our minds, because we realize who we are in reality, we always think it's Jesus plus. So I'm righteous before God because of Jesus, but plus, i got to do this, 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 and this. No, you don't. When He said it's finished, it's finished. I'm the righteousness of Christ because He said so. And because He did everything for me. Now what I'm supposed to do after that is follow Him. But He said, you know what? While you're following me, come unto me. If you're weary and heavy laden. And He says, I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me because I'm meek and lowly of heart. And I will give you rest even unto your souls. Have you ever been tired and you just say, man, I need a break. And you just want to take a day off and just lay on the couch and watch reruns and eat Snickers bars. I don't know, however you want to relax. But your mind's going 200 miles an hour. And when you get up the next day to go back to your, your life, you don't feel any better than you did before. But Jesus can give us rest, even right under our souls. And the way He does that is He takes away all that fear, takes away all that thinking, i got to do this and i got to do that and i got to do this. You don't got to do nothing. You do things because we want to, not because we have to. And you know, we, we see all the injustice in the world and say, well, Lord, i got to fight this and i got to expose this and i got to stop this. Well, Jesus knows about it more than you do. And He's not worried about it. You know, if, if we see a, a banana peel on the floor here, I'm going to tell everybody, hey, be careful, there's a banana peel here, just walk around it. But I don't then spend the rest of my life trying to do a deep, dark, secret, in-depth study about who put that banana peel there and why it's there. The devil did it, okay? Any injustice in the world, any evil in the world, the devil did it, okay? He works through people. Wow, big surprise. We're not supposed to destroy people, we're supposed to just warn people about what's going on. And once you've exposed it and you've warned them, just move on. Because 
If you feel like you have to correct all the injustice in the world, get, you, get ready because you're not going to have much peace in the world. Jesus said, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. Jesus said, the tares grow up with the wheat. But it ain't always going to be so. Because he said, someday shall not the judge of all the earth do what's right. Don't worry. All the judgment is going to happen and that which is wrong will be exposed and it's going to be taken care of. It's not my job, it's his job. So there's so many things that we can get with the best of intentions, get tied up in a knot when he says, I'm your Jehovah Shalom. I'm your peace. He knows more than we do and he's not worried about anything. Yeah, but if I don't worry, that means I don't care. I learned a long time ago I love you, and I care, but I don't have enough in my bank account, my worry bank account, to worry about you. Because, you know, when people come to me and they tell me their problems, it moves me. I'm, I'm concerned. I don't want people to hurt. But I used to worry about it. But if I do, I'll end up being emotionally bankrupt. I can't worry. So if ever you say, well, how come you're not worried about it? I can't afford it. I don't have enough money in my worry bank account. Mm -hmm. I care, but I'm not going to worry. I'm just going to give it to Jesus because I'm trusting He's going to take care of it someday. He'll expose things. He'll right all the wrong in this world. But in the meantime, I'm just keeping my eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. And He said, come unto me if you're weary and heavy laden. If you're following Jesus and you're tied up in a knot, just ask yourself, what are you worried about? Come unto Jesus. He said, learn of me. In other words, watch and see how I do it. My yoke, it's easy. It fits perfectly around my neck and around your neck. And as you know, a yoke is for to tie two animals together because it cuts the workload in half. So I'm yoked in with Jesus. Now when I'm having a bad day, He carries me through. But the good thing is, the one I'm yoked into, Jesus, he never has a bad day. So I don't ever have to carry his load. But he says, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart, and I'll give you rest right unto your souls. And then in Hebrews it says there's a peace. There's a rest that remains for the people of God. But they have to cease from their own works. So don't, don't think Jesus plus. I got to do this and I got to do that. And I got to save this and I got to expose that. And I got to wear this and I got to be there. Says who? You follow Jesus. You know, I was in one church once when I was a new Christian, and this um, one lady came out, and she was an older lady. They wheeled, him on, wheeled her out on a wheelchair, and um, she says, Oh, my people, I have a burden of the Lord. I have a burden of the Lord. And she made us all turn around. And that's when churches had pews, and we had to kneel, and we had to bury our face in the pew, and we had to cry out to God for this burden. So, I'm a new Christian. I don't know, this is, I guess that's what Christians do. So I obediently got on my knees, and I'm burying my face in the pew, and I'm hearing all these people, Oh, God! Oh! And all this screaming and wailing. And I'm thinking, man, Jesus, I used to cry all the time. Now that I gave my life to you, I have joy. Why do I have to get this burden? And then I read where Jesus said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you say, Oh, I got a burden of the Lord, well, which Lord did you get it from? Because my Jesus said his burden is light. It's not Jesus plus. He did it on the cross. It's finished. Now you just follow him, take that peace, because he says, I am your Jehovah Shalom. I want to give you peace. Why do you keep getting tied up in a knot? Don't worry about it. I'm not worried about it. Don't you worry about it. I'll take care of it. you got to trust me. He then goes on to say, I am your Jehovah Sabbath, which means I am the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. When I pray, almost every morning I pray this, um, not every morning, but most mornings I pray the Lord's Prayer to get kind of warmed up and get started. And I just say, you know, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And when I pray for me and Bobette and her family and my family, and I pray for New Hope Christian Church, 
and everybody that calls this church their home. I pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. I don't want to sin against you today, and I don't want anyone else to sin against you today. Lord, help us. And I say, deliver us from evil, because there's evil in the world. There's people in this world that don't like you just because you're a Christian or because you're an American or because you're the wrong color or you're, you're the wrong strata of society. There's a lot of hatred out there. But also in the spirit world, we know there's the spirits that want to steal, kill, and destroy. And we have an enemy that's a roaring lion wanting to devour. So we wake up every morning with a lot of enemies against us. Well, that's something to worry about, right? No, because my God says, I am Jehovah Sabbath. I'm the Lord of hosts. I'm the Lord of armies. Remember when Satan came before God in the book of Job and presented himself with the sons of God? And God says to him, hey, have you considered my servant Job down here? And he says, yeah, I'd like to give him a black eye, but I can't get to him. he got a hedge built around him. He says... You bet your bippy I do. And he's got a hedge of protection built around us because he's our Jehovah Sabbath. He's the Lord of hosts. Nobody can beat me up unless they can first beat up Jesus. And there ain't no devil in hell can beat up Jesus. So he is our, our Jehovah Sabbath, which leads us to next Jehovah Roha. He is the Lord, my shepherd, my protector. Like I mentioned two weeks ago, the last time I preached, I preached on the Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So He's our shepherd. He protects us from all these enemies out there. But you know what else He does? He protects us from ourselves. Because, let's be honest, we're human. We live in sinful bodies with seven billion other sinners and a a spirit world that's out there just saying, just do it, just do it. Everyone else is doing it. It's fun. It'll be so much fun. Just do it. Don't worry what God says, what your mom says, what your dad says. Just do it. And it's just around us, all these voices every day. Well, what a shepherd does is he keeps his sheep together and he protects them. But when he sees a sheep going a little bit astray, he gets thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He gets one end of his staff and he taps him on the rear end and says, hey, get back in line and a good sheep will follow along. But if you get a sheep that's a little bit more stubborn and he goes wandering off a little bit more, he'll get the crook, the hook end of his, of his staff and he'll hook it around their neck and pull them back in. But then some sheep, I know one personally, get so wild and rebellious that they just take off. For two years, I backslid. I don't recommend that. I backslid as full blast back into the world as I could. And you know what he does? It says he'll leave the 99 healthy ones to go after that one that went astray. And when he gets them, he breaks their leg. And then he binds it up. And that sheep's staggering around on three legs, trying to keep up with the other sheep. But he's right next to the shepherd until his leg mends. And all that time, he's spending more close time to the shepherd than any of the other sheep. So that when that leg mends, he realizes who his shepherd is, how good he is. And like Jesus said, who is he who's been forgiven much, loveth much. He's our shepherd. He's our provider. And you know what? When sheep are sleeping, the shepherd's not. He's watching out for wolves, and like David said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. doesn't matter what's coming after you. The shepherd is watching. So when I go to sleep at night, I lay my head on my pillow and I pray 1 John 1, 9. You know, I, you know, if you confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, wash me clean from everything I said, did, thought today that's not pleasant with you. And now I put all my loved ones and everything that's important to me, I put it in your hands. And I'm asking you to take care of it. And then I put on the helmet of salvation and I go to sleep. Now I wish I could say I sleep like a baby every night, but not always. Sometimes the devil attacks me in dreams and other things, but a shepherd watches over his sheep when they sleep. And then, the last one, 
Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. Now think of a banner. When I think of a banner, I just think of a long piece of cloth that says something on it, right? <clears throat> just think if you go to like a, a convention and it says, you know, we are the doorknob salesmen of the world. <laughs> or you go to a, you know, some kind of function and you put your, your name up there. I am Joe of America, come vote for me, or whatever. Whatever you're, you're pronouncing, whatever you're announcing, whatever you're presenting, you have a banner over that. Well, with a Christian, a follower of Jesus, the banner says, Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the spirit world, remember when um, uh, the sons of Sceva, the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out a devil in the book of Acts? Because they saw Paul doing it and said, hey, that's pretty cool. Why don't we do that? Maybe we make a living doing that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get a big ministry. We'll get a water slide and a book deal. and We'll get a publicist. We'll be famous. Yeah, let's do that. Well, the, they come across a real demon-possessed person. And the devil says, um, Jesus we know. And Paul we know. But who in the world do you think you are? And they beat him and they stripped him naked and chased him out of the city. Well... The fallen angels, they know who belongs to Jesus. It says, Paul says, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I truly believe in the spirit realm, somehow, when God looks upon the earth, and when the fallen angels look upon the earth, they know who belongs to God and who doesn't. And they say, oh, I can't touch them, because the banner over us, is love. Just like that hedge of protection God put over Job, the banner over us is like a dome of protection. The banner over us. This is Jesus Christ, property of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us His banner over us is love. Now I want to share something with you that um, the last night of the convention Mike Player preached and he said a lot of good things. But he, he brought out this one word in the Greek that I never thought of before. And it just it blessed me so much I want to share it with you. And it's found in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Paul says, And hope maketh not ashamed. If you're hoping for something, and you're trusting in something, God's going to take care of me. He's going to keep me in peace. He's going to bless me. He's going to meet my needs. If you're hoping in that, it's never ashamed in God. You'll, you'll never meet anybody at the end of their life that trusted the Lord that's going to say, ah, I, I wasted my life. I wish I would have been a devil worshiper. Ah, I wish I would have just took care of myself and would have been rich and famous. I've been around a number of people when they take their last breath before they leave the planet Earth and they die. I never one time had somebody say, oh man, I wish I would have made another 100000 Never. They all say, oh, I wish I would have had a better relationship with somebody, or why did I wait so long to give my life to Jesus? But if you put your hope in Him, you're not going to be ashamed. Remember, your life's not going to be easy, but you're never going to be ashamed because He says this, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And I never studied the word shed abroad in the Greek before. And both words, shed and abroad, are the same Greek word. And you know what it means? It means to cascade. So we, you know, we tell each other, oh, God loves you. And in our minds we think, yeah, well, I know who I really am. I know what thoughts are in my mind. I know what I've been tempted to do. Yeah, He doesn't love me as much as them over there. I know they're all holy. They're perfect. Or you say, oh, God loves you. Yeah, yeah, well, prove it. You know, how come it hurts when I go like this? How come I don't, I'm not driving a brand new car? Yeah, God loves us. And we think, we think of God's love towards us as just like a little drip, drip, drip in a bucket. But when it says here, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, that word shed abroad means to cascade, like a waterfall. So what Mike Player was saying, Brother Player was saying, just think, have you ever been to Niagara Falls and seen that water falling over the edge? I always wonder, how come Lake Ni or River Niagara doesn't run out of water? 
I mean, it just keeps pouring over. And it keeps pouring over like a, like a mighty millions and millions of gallons of water. It's cascading. That's the love that God has for us. He loves us so much, it's cascading into our hearts. It's pouring into our lives. And because of all that, and because of God saying, I am, all things were made by me, and the things that were not made by me were not made. I am that I am. And I am your Jehovah. I'm your Jehovah Yahweh, your Jehovah Elohim. I'm your provider. I'm the one that heals you. I'm the one that sanctifies you and makes you holy. I'm your peace. I'm your righteousness. I'm the Lord of hosts and the Lord of armies. I'm your shepherd. I'm your protector. And I'm your banner, your dome of protection. I am that I am. All those things because I love you so much. My love towards you is cascading into your hearts. So with all that, how much more can we say and believe Romans 8.31? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I guarantee you, no matter what you're going through, you're not going through it alone. And He is your Jehovah. So what I want to do to close this out, is I want to ask anyone who would like. See, I, I just I just have this desire, I want to hug you. But I can't. For a lot of reasons, the way the world is today. But I want to hug you with the Word of God. So if anybody has a need in their life, I want you to come up and just me and you, I'm going to pray. I'm just going to put my hands on your shoulder. I'm not going to hug you. I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. But I'm just going to pray for you that you receive that from God because He is, whatever you don't have, He is. He is I Am. And I don't want nobody here to leave discouraged or lacking or saying, oh, I wish I had this. I just want to pray with you.